Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to NASA's web seminar on the National Endowment for the Arts report, Living Traditions. Our session is just about to get underway, and I welcome you to it. I'm going to turn things over to Ryan, who's going to get things rolling. Ryan? Thanks, Eric. Great. So first, I would <clears throat> like to just briefly say that it's great to have the data insights and recommendations that are in the Living Traditions report that we'll be hearing about today. Uh, we all know that the partnership that exists between state arts agencies and the National Endowment for the Arts is a strong one, and it is particularly strong in the work that occurs via folk arts partnerships. So we're happy uh, today to have Cliff Murphy, Director of Folk and Traditional Arts at the National Endowment for the Arts, and Sunil Iyengar, the Director of Research and Analysis at the National Endowment for the Arts, uh, to learn more about this portfolio analysis. Uh, having clear data on how living traditions thrive in all areas of the country is helpful and illuminating in a way that enhances all of the stories uh, and narratives which we know are intrinsic to the folk and traditional arts. So with that, uh, I will hand things over, I think, first to Sunil. Sunil, take it away. Yes, thank you, Ryan. And I want to I thank uh, Ryan and Eric for uh, asking Cliff and me to present to you about today's report. Uh, this is a report that in many respects is in a different category from other research our office normally produces. Um, again, I'm the research director for the Arts Endowment, and it's been a pleasure to work with Cliff and his staff to learn more and more about the kinds of opportunities, artists, and communities he serves. This is a portfolio review of his program, Folk and Traditional Arts at the Arts Endowment. Next slide, please. First, I'd like to discuss what this uh, species of report is, why we produced it, and how. Um, then I'll go into the findings from this portfolio review, which drew on quantitative and qualitative data sources. And then I'll wrap up with some overarching conclusions. At that point, I'll turn it over to Cliff, who will say something about the report's broader implications and potential action items. Uh, so I have a spoiler alert. Um, unlike other reports we've issued in a long while, this one carries recommendations up front in an attempt to bring home to arts organizations and state arts agencies, for example, the reach and relevance of this portfolio to their own work and how we can move forward together. And here's the report. As you can see, the slide has the report cover. Uh, you can find the report at arts.gov under publications or at the folk and traditional arts or research web pages. Next slide, please. So what is the Folk and Traditional Arts Portfolio at the Arts Endowment? If you go to our website, um, you'll find about 19 different artistic or programmatic disciplines represented that are supported by the agency, of which Folk and Traditional Arts is obviously one. We support these projects through folk arts partnerships, which are typically directed by state folklorists, and which, as you know, are awarded to state arts agencies, regional arts organizations, and other nonprofit organizations. This latter group makes up about 20% of all folk arts partnerships in general. There are over 40 folk arts partnerships nationwide. We support only one per any given state. So we're talking $10,000 to $50,000 per award here. The second type of support we provide for this category is through direct grants that our agency makes to nonprofit organizations in support of projects celebrating creativity and cultural heritage. The range of projects supported is wide from apprenticeship programs to community engagement projects to documentation of traditions. Here we're talking about matching grants from $10,000 to $100,000. It's important to remember that these grants are not awarded solely by Cliff's Office, Folk and Traditional Arts, that is any other discipline office of the Arts Endowment, whether music, dance, theater, arts education, et cetera, may offer grants to support folk and traditional projects or activities. But Cliff's Office tends to emphasize the transmission of traditions documentation through field work and archiving and interpretation or sharing of cultures with different communities through events and publications, for example. Lastly, there's the National Heritage Fellowship. This is a Lifetime Achievement Award regarded as the nation's highest honor in the folk and traditional arts. Nominated by the public, nine fellows are selected annually covering crafts, dance, music, oral traditions, visual arts, and other disciplines absorbed as part of the cultural life of the community. One with a common ethnic heritage, cultural mores, language, religion, occupation, or even geographic region. The fellows receive meda medallions at a lab Library of Congress event where they are also recognized by congressional members, and they participate in a concert in the Washington, D.C. area and broadcast online. Uh, the award is tied to a $25,000 honorific. Next slide, please. 
So why did we dive into our folk and traditional arts portfolio in particular? So there's several reasons. One is simple. Um, Cliff reached out to our office, Cliff Murphy, with some thoughtful questions about what his discipline had accomplished in recent years and what kinds of activities and outcomes were being reported by grantees. The first phase of this work, in fact, was a review of the Folk Arts Partnerships Program, which yielded a 42-page report of qualitative research findings related to these awards. That report was posted to our website in 2017, and it helped to undergird the project we are now discussing. Two, this is a historically understudied area, folk and traditional arts. At the Arts Endowment alone, I can confidently say that folk and traditional arts has not made it to our desk as a topic of study for the 14 or so years I've been here. There have been some great reports in the field. I'm thinking, of, for example, of some publications we've seen from the Alliance for California Traditional Arts, among others. Third is a very Washington, D.C. reason. Um, as part of the NEA learning agenda we have developed in response to guidance from Congress and from the Office of Management and Budget to all federal agencies, we've selected specific research questions that can better drive decision-making at the Arts Endowment. Among those questions are those pertaining to um, the reach and impact of our folk and traditional awards. So when Cliff suggested this study, it dovetailed with this broader mandate to more closely review grants data within a research framework. Finally, there are some historical milestones to consider. As Cliff observes in his introduction to the report, the history of the Folk and Traditional Arts Division at the endowment is bound up with the bicentennial celebrations of 1976. Around that year, the Arts Endowment began funding comprehensive efforts to record and present the nation's cultural traditions. It also launched folk arts partnerships, as you know, at state arts agencies as part of a national network. The 250th anniversary of the United States is not too far on the horizon, so it seemed right to take stock of folk and traditional arts at this moment in time and maybe look ahead to ways of celebrating these award opportunities. Next slide. Here's how we approach this task. As a starting point, our office used that study I mentioned earlier, the qualitative analysis we'd conducted using data from folk arts partnerships. The author had been Courtney Malloy. We reviewed program guidelines, applications, and grantee reports for all these three components of the folk and traditional arts portfolio. A word about uh, direct grants. Now, as I mentioned, the direct grants awarded to folk and traditional arts projects may come from any discipline office at the Arts Endowment. But for a more fine-grained analysis, we looked specifically at grants awarded by Cliff's office from our fiscal years 2013 through 2015. We looked at communities served, inputs, activities and outputs, and barriers to intended outcomes. The reason for selecting these three years was largely contingent on volume of materials to review in our own workflow. 2015 was the most recent year for which, at the time of undertaking our analysis, we were confident we would have a large enough sample of grantees' final reports to review. We also interviewed grant project and partnership directors and at least one National Heritage Fellowship awardee in compiling this report. Next slide. So here by the numbers is the size of the total Folk and Traditional Arts Award portfolio over that two-year period, uh, $13.8 million, and how it's broken, up, broken out throughout, through the types of awards we make. The longest bar at the bottom is due to awards we made directly to nonprofit organizations in fiscal years uh, 2013 to 2015. Those awards were made not only by the Folk and Traditional Arts Office, but by NEA programs such as Arts Education, Challenge America, Creativity Connects, and Our Town. They totaled 357 direct grants made to 296 nonprofit organizations over the three-year period, with a number of grantees receiving an award multiple times. The next longest bar is represented by our Folk Arts Partnership Awards, the ones made specifically to state arts agencies and regional arts organizations, or 87 grants over three years. And as I said, we also make partnership grants to other types of nonprofit agencies, in this case, 28 grants, or 7% of the total dollar amount of folk and traditional award, arts awards from 2013 to 15. And finally, we've, we made recognize, uh, sorry, we recognized uh, two, 28 folk and traditional artists through National Heritage Awards covering 20 different states. Next slide, please. If you remove National Heritage Rewards from the mix, um, as these are really awards only made to, in, made to individual artists, let's see how our folk and traditional arts funding to organizations has fared nationally when we account for population size. What you have before you is a dollars per capita representation of our awards through direct grants, but also through partnership grants by state. The dark blue states, or maybe dark green, are Alaska, Maine, and Wyoming, 
which together receive the largest amount of folk and traditional arts support per capita. Then you have states such as Louisiana, both Dakotas, Vermont, and New York. The remaining blue shaded states make up the largest group in terms of funding levels per capita. And then you have about 12 states shown in yellow where folk and traditional arts funding is at the lowest level per capita, zero to $176 per 10,000 people. Next slide. Next, yeah, thanks. Let's scratch the surface. Here you see a distribution of our direct grant awards only and the locations of projects funded by those awards, again for years 2013 through 2015. This is a busy map, as is the next one I'll be showing. They all come straight from the report, but let me break it down for you. We are concerned here with showing three different dimensions of geography, rural areas, small metro areas, that are those with populations between 50,000 and 250,000 people, and large metro areas, where the population is at least 250,000 people. Those dimensions are shown in different color shades on the map, and the dots on the map all capture the locations of either the award recipient or the locations of project activities conducted by those grantees, depending on the color used. You can review this and the other maps at leisure, but what we want to point out here is that over one in four project activities supported by these grants, that is 27% occur in rural areas shown in light blue. That's nearly double the share of rural activities associated with other arts endowment grants, i.e. non-folk and traditional arts related. It's also double the share of the U.S. population that lives in rural areas, 14%. At the same time, 12% of endowment-supported grant activities in folk and traditional arts occurred in small communities or small metro areas. As you can see, just by gauging where the dots lie, um, grant awards and project activity locations are heavily represented in the eastern half of the U.S. They often coincide with regions that have a high profile in the traditional arts, for example, the Appalachian region and Louisiana, or states with historically robust folk arts partnerships, as we say in the report, California, Kentucky, Louisiana, again, New York, and Oregon. Next slide. Another map. This one focuses on both awards and project activity locations, but looking particularly at what are called poverty-bound areas. These are census tracts where 20% or more of the population live below the federal poverty line. More than half, 52% of organizations getting direct folk and traditional arts awards from us are in these high poverty areas. 54%, sorry, 45% of supported projects actually took place in high poverty areas, which is comparable to the 43% of all arts endowment funded activity locations in high poverty areas, and slightly above the 31% of the US population that live in places of high poverty. I'm going to transition here by talking a bit about the so-called underserved populations in general who benefit from these grants. During the study period, roughly half, that's 49% of our folk and traditional arts grantees reported engaging one or more of these uh, underserved populations, a much greater share than the 32% reported by the total pool of direct grant recipients from across the agency. Here the term underserved refers to a number of special population types determined by the final descriptive reports that our grantees fill out at the end of their awards with us. Next slide. As you're aware, uh, the state arts agencies, regional arts organizations, and other groups who get folk arts partnerships awards from us are major exponents of this work to underserved communities. By order of frequency cited in their reports to us, these populations are as follows. Immigrants, tribal native communities, rural communities, refugees, Pacific Islanders and Asian communities, uh, African American communities, Latinos, and older adults. Next slide. We talked a little bit about direct grants in folk and traditional arts in terms of where, they, where the grants go and their locations of the activities, and we've also talked a little bit about statewide folk, and arts, folk arts partnerships. But what about the reach of National Heritage Fellows? Unlike the other maps I've shown you, this one shows not only the three-year cohort we've been studying, 2013 through 15, but also all fellows going back to 1982, covering more than 400 total. This represents every state, four territories, and more than 200 distinct artistic traditions. What you find here is that dots are all over the map. The states with robust, even though that's the case, states with robust folk life infrastructure tend to have more nominees than do other states over time. Next slide, please. Here are the different race or ethnicity groups represented among the National Heritage Fellows since 1982. Apart from the high prevalence of Anglo-American recipients, 
you also see a fairly high number of recipients who are African Americans, including African, Brazilian, or Creole, and roughly comparable numbers of Native Americans or Alaskan Natives, Hispanics, or a category called Euro-American. Of possible interest, men have been fellow recipients nearly twice as often as women have, and only 3% of fellowship awards have gone to duos or groups. Next slide. So far, we've spent a lot of time talking about the locations and populations served by folk and traditional arts, but what do these awards accomplish specifically? So again, setting aside the statewide folk arts partnerships, which as I said, was a topic of a separate report in 2017, and setting aside National Heritage Fellows, here are the most commonly reported activities funded by our direct grantees in folk and traditional arts. Uh, sorry, support, uh, supporting direct grants in folk and traditional arts. We're back to the most recent three-year time frame. The top activities are, in order, public events, what are here called knowledge sharing activities, including conferences, lectures, or presentations, field work, research, and documentation of traditional arts, and school-based activities. As for outcomes reported by these grantees, the most commonly reported ones were engaging the public, including increasing public knowledge, appreciation, and interest in traditional arts, but we also reported um, they also reported high rates of sustaining living art forms through education and apprenticeship programs, improvements in economic and professional advancement of artists, increased practice of traditional arts, and transmission of artistic skills and knowledge. Nearly half of grantees reported that projects ended up strengthening economic and professional opportunities for artists in their communities with these projects, taking the form of greater income or new business skills. Next slide. So we found that the best way to get a handle on what the folk and traditional arts portfolio has to offer is not only by mining quantitative and qualitative data in grantees' final reports to us, but also doing some mini case studies or vignettes of a handful of projects. The, uh, these aren't all direct grants, one's a partnership and another a fellow, and I can't hope to do them justice in such a brief amount of time, but I want to signal that we have two page written write-ups, about two pages each, for each, each of these cases as an addendum to the report on our website, arts.gov. And also their examples are sprinkled throughout the report as relevant. So let's start with African Caribbean Dance, Com da Caribbean Dance Theater in Tallahassee, Florida, or ACDT. This group engages and educates its surrounding community through live performances of African drumming and dance and associated workshops and demos. They got a $10,000 grant for us to support the Florida African Dance Festival in 2013 and another $25,000 in 2015 for the same project. ACDT was established 25 years ago to serve the community's youth. Today, its goal is to instill self-respect, self-esteem, self-confidence, discipline, and a sense of community and cultural pride among individuals. Through teaching African dance and drumming activities, ACDT also helps to preserve these folk and traditional art forms. The majority of their students are African-American girls and women ranging in age from 5 to 55 years old, coming primarily from urban environments. And you can see a nice quote here by the co-founder, Jevil Robinson, um, noting a, in particular about how their self-esteem and confidence has improved, that is to say, the students in the course of their involvement with this program and how rewarding that's been. Next slide, please. This one is Les Senzon Les Mexican American Center, uh, which has a project called Routes of Resilience that was funded in the three consecutive years of the study period. This center in San Pablo, California has become a Bay Area cultural arts cornerstone and an innovative leader in participatory arts programming that meets the needs of a growing Latino community. The program Routes of Resilience uses music performances, uh, documentaries, and web-based videos rooted in traditional and contemporary Mexican-American art forms to share personal narratives on challenging transitions unique to this population. The center hosts an academy that offers students of all ages lessons in music, dance, arts, and crafts taught by master Mexican artists. Classes are held weekly for over 200 students, usually from the neighborhood. Altogether, the center instills youth with a strong, positive sense of their cultural heritage and their personal potential to excel. And here's a sample quote from Eugene Rodriguez. Um, he, he notes in particular that this is a real eye-opener for the kids who, for the, for the, certainly for the program people, but certainly for the kids in terms of uh, realizing uh, how the neighborhood in the past historically might not have ex uh, expected as much from the kids, um, but in fact their capacity shines through, through this program. Next slide, please. 
Moving to an example of a folk arts partnership, Idaho Commission on the Arts in Boise runs a program with a strong educational focus that includes workshops, symposia, professional development for artists, and community education on folk life. Its director travels extensively throughout the state to meet traditional artists, going door to door to recruit potential candidates uh, for the traditional arts apprenticeships and a grants program called Quick Funds. I could use some Quick Funds. Anyway, just to, just to name a few key projects of the commission. There is a story quilt prod project, which involves a touring exhibit of narrative quilts put together by refugees in Boise. The Mexican music project, documenting traditional and non-traditional Mexican music through music creation and recording of live performances in small agricultural towns in southern Idaho. And the archives project, which organizes, digitizes, and makes available online more than 30 years of folk arts history. So quite a powerhouse. In addition, the Community Scholars Project hosts workshops in various communities on the fundamentals of folk life. In terms of the direct results from this investment, the Commission reports an increase in applications for its apprenticeship program and quarterly grants, and more competitive applications they've been seeing for these opportunities. But also, they've been seeing growing uh, awareness of folk and traditional arts throughout the state. Pretty remarkable considering Idaho is a large state and the budget supports only one staff person. Steve Hatcher there. Next slide, please. This one's about our National Heritage Fellows Program. Dolly Cabos and her, um, her uh, husband, sorry, Do Dolly Jacobs, sorry, and her husband, Padre, pa Pedro Reyes, uh, co-founded, co I should say, the Circus Arts Conservatory in Sarasota, Florida, in order to continue the traditions she learned from family members. Her father, Lou Jacobs, was an internationally famous circus clown who dedicates, dedicated more than 60 years of his life to the circus. Her godmother, Margie Geiger, performed acrobatic maneuvers on the Roman rings and passed the art form on to Jacobs. Dolly Jacobs was named National Heritage Fellow in 2015, and she invested her monetary award into the conservatory's many programs. I wouldn't be surprised if, a lot, if we see that a lot of uh, fellows do that similar kind of reinvestment to their programs. She continues to pass down the circus arts through the Sailor Circus Program, one of the oldest circus schools in America, which her conservatory now runs. The group works with area schools and retirement centers. Circuses blend a variety of art forms, from dance and music to theater, as we all know, requiring the same skill sets of costuming, performance, athleticism, and choreography as those arts. In addition, like many of the folk arts, circuses are affordable and reach extremely diverse audiences in communities both urban and rural. Uh, Dolly Jacobs claims that the Fellowship Award allowed her to present the profession in a more positive light and help to elevate the profile of the circus arts as a legitimate art form. Next slide, please. Last but not least, the museum at Eldridge Street in New York City. This one's a direct grant of ours. has supported an egg rolls and egg creams festival for each of the three years of our study period, diversifying in year three to include empanadas. This festival showcases the cultural commonalities and distinctive voices of a racially and ethnically, ethnically diverse community through a mashup of fast festival tastes, traditions, sights, and sounds. Uh, the neighborhoods served involve residents of Chinese, East European, Jewish, and Puerto Rican origins. It's a free day-long event with dance, music, and storytelling performances accompanied by lectures and folk artist demos. Featured performances include selections from Chinese opera and Jewish klezmer music, as well as bomba and plena forms of traditional Puerto Rican music and dance. And of course, the food, which festival visitors can watch demonstrators discuss and create. Chinese and Spanish translators are on hand and printed materials are provided in both Mandarin and Spanish. Of note, as a result of the festival, the museum has increasingly incorporated the featured cultures and languages into its own programming throughout the year, the museum that is. Staff have also seen uh, festival attendees come back to the museum for concerts, lectures, and programs. Here's the quote from Eva Brun. Next slide. Now, as I mentioned earlier, apprenticeships are a big part of what we tend to see happening through our direct grants and through state folk arts partnerships. Here's a sample of apprenticeships we've supported through our direct grants. This table is in the full report, showing you the kind of exhibits and figures and statistics we have in this report. Uh, next slide. And I want to end with a quote from a section of the report that is headed, The Multiplier Effect of Partnerships, and is really apropos to this specific audience, you as state arts agencies and regionals. 
Just as background, well over half of our direct grantees over the study period reported partnering with other artists and arts organizations. Other commonly reported partners include state and local government agencies, as well as colleges and universities. Equally important, the range of such partnerships was considerable, including tribal communities, media organizations, school districts, libraries, religious groups, and historical societies. So this quote is from Alabama State Council on the Arts. Uh, they note that ASCA used uh, arts endowment funding to bolster statewide folk life research and programming through our partnership with the Alabama Folk Life Association. Our biggest tool in maintaining and improving the state's infrastructure for folk and traditional arts is strategic partnerships with like-minded organizations. Having the solid organizational footing has paid great dividends in board development, archiving, and the presentation of new programs. We often talk about the multiplier effect, at least in research when we talk about economics and economic impact studies. But one of the themes throughout this report is just how connected folk, uh, active folk um, organizations are, folk arts organizations, uh, either through the partnership model or through the direct grants, and how sustaining and re reaffirming these partnerships have been in generating new funds and new activities in future years. So uh, the next slide, if you'll go to it, is just a, an infographic that we have on our web. Oh, sorry, I thought I'd had it on this slide. Uh, Maybe it's in the next slide. It'll surprise me, so let's stick with the conclusions. Uh, the conclusions, just some overarching conclusions before we get to a quick infographic. Is um, uh, So as you can see here, overall, we're, we're saying through our report, the Arts Endowment is pleased to reach a high proportion of rural residents, high poverty areas, and historically underserved or marginalized communities through its Folk and Traditional Arts Awards portfolio. Two, the agency's grant-supported activities have a dual focus on engaging the public and documenting and sustaining folk and traditional arts. And this is really, this really rings true, especially through the qualitative data. Three, across the agency's awards portfolio, strategic partnerships with a variety of individuals, organizations, and sectors are vital to promoting and sustaining the folk and traditional arts. Next slide, please. Yeah, here's that infographic. And just to remind you, you can go to our website to get information about uh, the report, an infographic, and a blog we posting we did about this report. And the next slide. So I'm going to turn it over to Clip. I just wanted to say that um, I, I said at the outset this is a little bit different from reports we've done where we often put a lot of energy into studying arts as a phenomenon in our society and how it impacts individuals and communities. But this was a look inward to really dig deep into our portfolio. We certainly hope to do many more of these kinds of studies for other artistic disciplines. And I know states will be a crucial partner partners in that role, in that function, I should say. Um, but before I, we get to clip, I just want to note that um, Marianne Carter, our chairman, took a high interest in this report and encouraged us and I could say somewhat liberated us to really think through what are some implications of these findings to really front load the report with recommendations, which Clip will now talk about. So Clip. Thank you, Sunil. Uh, can everybody hear me? I guess I'm asking a silent audience, so I'm, <laughs> I'm going to assume that you can. Um, Thanks everybody for for calling in. Um, yeah, this has been uh, this has been exciting, uh, frankly, to uh, to be able to pull together this information and to try to really get a, a sense of um, of what this field looks like in terms of the investments that um, that the Arts Endowment uh, has been making. Um, and you know, I I can walk through these recommendations. Um, bef before I do that, um, just a, a really fast um, history lesson. Um, you know, folk arts partnerships um, were created, they were really launched in 1974 uh, by the Arts Endowment, uh, and, and those programs came out of uh, kind of the marriage of, of uh, two uh, distinct needs, right? One was at the state level, uh, communities across the country, states across the country were, uh, you know, this was a, a time of significant uh, cultural and technological change in the lead up to the bicentennial. Um, and uh, states across the country were really pushing for programs uh, that documented uh, the, the everyday life and culture, uh, cultural practices of, of, uh, that, that made each place distinct. Right? They wanted to see archives, they wanted to see public programs that really looked at the folk life of different places across the country, 
uh, and that would be accessible as a resource to community members and to educators. Um, so that was that was this real grassroots driven um, initiative that really kind of dovetailed with uh, a strategic need on both the part of state arts agencies and of the National Endowment for the Arts to develop effective tools uh, to reach rural, working class, immigrant, uh, urban, and impoverished communities, places where the kinds of infrastructure that um, arts agencies um, speak to most fluently uh, are probably in the shortest supply. And uh, folk arts partnerships were really developed to, uh, to kind of do both of those things, right? To uh, begin documenting culture for public, as, as a public resource, uh, but also to tie these communities that uh, folklorists were meeting um, to the resource arts agencies and to the resources of the National Endowment for the Arts, right? And so what you can see on, on the funding maps is uh, is a, a little bit of a symbol of that investment, right? Is that uh, you you find that in states that have um, had very robust um, investment in folk arts partnerships, both um, from the arts endowment and from sta their state, uh, you find that there is a, a constellation of nonprofits and community organizations, universities. Um, that are serving that constituency that back in 1974 was not being served particularly well by arts agencies, right? And so what you have here is a tool that is time-tested, um, that, is, that is reaching these very hard-to-reach communities. Um, in, in, in many ways, and, and I've been at the Arts Endowment now for four years, um, and I have been uh, fortunate to visit, I think, about half of the states in the country at this point, um, to visit with many uh, executive directors and, and state folklorists. And in many ways, we're, we're, uh, we're back in changing times. Um, and we are in this space where, as, uh, as arts agencies, um, we are putting a very high priority on greater inclusion uh, and deeper reach uh, into all communities uh, that that we are built to serve, right? So in many ways, there's a renewed need for, uh, for kind of a rededication to these kinds of programs. And you can see in this report, and this really jumped out to, to all of us, the Arts Endowment, is that folk and traditional arts grants really excel at reaching these communities more so than every other. So uh, that, in looking at the maps and in looking at where the gaps are in the maps, um, we have tried to develop some policy action steps that, that really uh, address that, right? So the first set of recommendations, what we have here is recommendation number one, is fix the gaps in the maps. Uh, in rural and poverty-bound regions of the United States. Um, so that really entails uh, trying to develop a, a creative approach to, uh, to building pilot programs in the Great Plains, uh, the Rocky Mountain West, and Alaska, right? So these are, in many ways, uh, both the most rural parts of, of the nation, generally speaking, and also the spaces where you find um, uh, in terms of our funding history uh, that uh, we need to do a better job of reaching, right? Um, uh, and in my visits to places like uh, North Dakota or to Utah or Arizona or Minnesota, right, there are, there are of course, uh, densely populated spaces, and then there are also these vast stretches of, of rural space um, that it is harder for us to reach. And so how do we begin to work um, uh, collectively and regionally um, to try to work together, uh, to try to link um, uh, strong um, existing infrastructures to kind of work collectively to, to accomplish these goals of reaching the people that are so hard to reach. Um, the other is, to, is, is 
a little bit more tightly focused, right, which is um, right now we have, uh, I believe, it's, it's fewer than 10 uh, city folk life programs in the country. Uh, it's closer to five um, is, would be the number. And uh, I think that there is uh, a real desire um, that we hear on a regular basis from, uh, from urban spaces across the country um, uh, to have programs that really uh, illuminate uh, the, the cultural practices that make all of these spaces distinct. And so how can we begin to try to, to, uh, to uh, make a greater investment in, uh, in the creation of, of programs, um, in, in city folk life programs? What you'll see here is that we aren't, uh, we aren't recommending the creation of new nonprofits. Um, we are not opposed to the creation of new nonprofits, but um, what we are hoping to do here is to, uh, to uh, begin to see the development of new programs at existing institutions uh, that can uh, deepen and extend the reach of, um, of our resources, uh, that can serve communities and can meet people where they live, both culturally and, um, and physically. Uh, the other set of recommendations here um, is really um, field specific, right? One of the things that you can see in this report, and one of the things that is exciting, at least to me, and I know that I'm biased, um, uh, is that we're beginning to consolidate some information to really look um, analytically at, uh, at the work that we do. What does it look like when you put it all on a map? What does it look like when we look at the financial investment of folk and traditional arts? What does it look like when we see the spaces that we are reaching and that we're not? Um, and how do we understand better uh, what makes programs work in specific environments uh, particularly well? Um, so, uh, we are calling for, uh, we're encouraging a stru structural and longitudinal analysis of traditional arts apprenticeship programs, right? So this is uh, a flagship program of many state arts agencies, uh, folk and traditional arts programs. Um, uh, these are, this has kind of been a long-standing approach to grant making to individual traditional artists um, that both puts money in their pockets uh, helps to celebrate um, a particular traditional art and um, and helps to facilitate the the uh, the passing on of traditions from uh, from one generation to another um, if that program has been in place uh, it's, it's been fairly common really since 1978 um, and yet we don't have that longitudinal analysis that looks at the legacy of these apprenticeships, right? Um, so those of us on, on this call who, um, who have uh, administered these programs know anecdotally that oftentimes um, over a 10-year period of time, somebody who may have been an apprentice in a program uh, comes back at a certain point as a master artist in that program. Uh, that is an indication that these are, are have become effective tools for uh, the continuity of culture. Um, they also are an indicator that there's a continuity of relationships between state arts agencies and cultural communities. Um, and how do we begin to look at that in a deep way to understand um, how it's working, how the funding works, every state funds these things differently. Um, uh, so what are the best practices in, in that area? Um, you know, another, and it's not on this slide, is doing something similar in terms of the, the structure, uh, funding, and best practices of folk arts partnerships programs, right, so the state folk life programs. Um, and then another recommendation is, um, is to host a national gathering of National Heritage Fellows uh, in 2022 uh, to mark the 40th anniversary of the program, right? So if you were to um, be able to visit with uh, the National Heritage Fellows, um, one of the things that you would find is that many of the fellows um, have had state arts agencies as strong advocates for 
uh, their national recognition, right? And there is a very real relationship between uh, a long-term state and federal investment in folk and traditional arts um, and arts, ad, you know, traditional arts advocacy, um, and the recognition of individual traditional artists. And and with that, um, I would just close by saying that um, I, I think that that is that is a really um, common theme here, right? Which is that in states that have um, have a long dedication to um, to folk and traditional arts. Um, you also find that, uh, you know, when the state is investing more dollars in folk and traditional arts, uh, more federal dollars are, are following that investment, right? So there are more um, project grant recipients in those states. There are more National Heritage Fellows in those states. Um, and so this, this also uh, is, is, a, is a wise investment. So um, I will wrap it up there and, uh, and then uh, turn it over for questions, but I um, just want to say thank you all for, um, for um, being with us today. Great. Thanks so much, uh, both Cliff and Sunil. Um, you see here uh, both their contact information is on the slide uh, if you have follow-up questions after this webinar, but uh, now is the time to um, ask some questions uh, while we have them online. So please uh, go ahead and type any questions that you have into the chat box and we'll relay them on to Cliff and Sunil. But um, to get things started, um, I imagine that uh, a big question that's on everybody's mind is whether or not there are plans to pursue the recommendations that are in the report and wondering if uh, either of you could speak to the National Endowment for the Arts plan to both fund and implement um, any or all of the recommendations. Cliff, you want to take that one? <laughs> sure, yeah, I'm happy to do that. Um, Always so, glad to be of help. <laughs> one, of, one of the, the uh, um, things that I'm sure that people are wondering is, is there a big chunk of money that is going to be set aside specifically to fund these new recommendations. And um, what I can tell you is that we're still waiting to find out what our actual budget is as an agency. And I think until we know that, uh, we will not know how much of um, kind of an, an additional investment we'll be able to make. Um, what, I can, what I do know is that um, it is encouraging to have the support of our chairman to put these recommendations in writing, um, and at, at a at a very minimum, uh, what these recommendations reflect, um, and that's really to be found on page three of the report of the Living Traditions report, um, is that these are indications of priority funding areas for our, our agency, right? Um, both for folk and traditional arts and as an agency. So. Um, if, uh, if you have an interest in um, pursuing projects, programs, initiatives in these areas, uh, we most certainly want to hear from you. And I, I say that both as the Folk and Traditional Arts uh, Director, but um, I'll also speak for Sunil um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of research. Um, I think that this is something that uh, a lot of work went into this report and um, we have, I know we have a lot of executive directors on, on the line today. Um, agencies don't uh, free up that much time to work on a report like this uh, if the agency isn't truly committed to, to following through on, on supporting this, this type of work. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Cliff. Uh, Ryan, this is Sunil again. Um, I neglected uh, when I ended my last slide I, to, to, uh, to Cliff's point about a lot of people help make this happen. I feel the need to acknowledge. Uh, wholeheartedly, a lot of the folks, not only Cliff and his team, and, and uh, William Mansfield is here, Bill Mansfield has helped a lot, but also on our staff, Bushra Akbar, Patricia Moore Schaefer, uh, and some, we even had a detail for this, Crystal Tomlin, who might be listening in, and Chitra Kalyan Dirk, um, who all helped with this, so thanks. Great. Um, yeah, uh, good to know that there's um, support and a, a large team working on this. Um, 
So one more question before getting into um, questions that are coming in from the audience. Um, you know, one thing that stuck out to me in the report was that um, it seems that uh, investments in folk and traditional arts seem to be particularly effective at reaching rural communities. Um, and Cliff, I think you spoke to this in your remarks about kind of the uh, historical infrastructure that's built up and um, uh, how that's built over time. Um, but wondering if you had any other thoughts about uh, why that is the case, um, and also if um, if do you think that provides any insights into how arts organizations can better serve rural areas in general? Well. Um you know, I, I think um, one of the challenges with a report like this, where you're looking at um, at a particular window of time, right? So we were looking at FY 13 through 15, and um, and those programs that um, that were in place during that window of time, right? Um, and so, uh, what was true for any particular place or or state at at that time may have changed a little bit, right? So folk arts partnerships are like everything else. They uh, they have peaks and valleys. And um, uh, I, I know, for instance, that if you look on the map here, there are states that are making a significant investment in folk and traditional arts um, uh, through state arts agency funding um, that isn't necessarily going to be reflected on that map. And that's some, um, some data that would be wonderful to be able to, um, to look more deeply at. Um, I, if, if, if I just take a quick look, I know um, uh, both uh, through, I know in, in places like Minnesota or in North Dakota, there is a, a very strong commitment. Um, and there's a very uh, sophisticated approach to reaching out to rural spaces. Um, and so how can we uh, collectively work to, to kind of get our arms around that information a little bit better? Um, but I, I think really what, um, what the, the particularly the rural um, part of this um, says is that, you know, if, if the spaces that are hardest to reach, you know, there's, there's a particular form of practice that, um, that this field has. Uh, I think in the report, Stephen Hatcher might call it um, porch sitting uh, or visiting, um, but that is a very real thing that uh, in some ways it's, it's a throwback style of government to the 1940s uh, where you have people who are actually visiting uh, and, and getting out of the office and getting into uh, communities that um, that may not be as familiar with the particular dialect of the arts that we speak as um, as government workers, you know. Um, and how can how can we how can we be, be better translators of that? Um, uh, what what we see over and over again is that um, showing up uh, is is probably the most important first step. Um, that, of course, is not unique to folk and traditional arts, um, but I would say that it's most pronounced um, in the communities that folk and traditional arts uh, thrive and, um, and are served. Does that answer your question? Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, yeah, thanks, thanks for that. Um, thanks for those insights. Um, so moving on, um, a question from the audience. Uh, how is the NEA defining, um, defining what, uh, what types of programs work well and why? Um, so uh, the question I think was alluded to in the recommendation, um, but the person asking is curious as to what defines works well for the programs. Um, is it about participation, demographics, uh, other sorts of outcomes, um, either Cliff or Sunil. Yeah, I'll just say my two cents first, if you don't mind, Cliff, about that from a metrics point of view. Um, for the purpose of the report, the sort of objective kind of measures we could use was purely based on reach, um, like where geographically this, these footprints of these programs were. 
and on um, clearly there's a lot of reported data which we mined. Um, so textual analysis of understanding how these, this is obviously self-reported at this point, how these grantees or in the case of a folk contrition, you know, for, uh, for example, Dolly Jacobs in terms of a uh, fellowship awardee, you know, how they reported, you know, what they had done with the investment, so to speak, or how they benefited from the award. Um, so that was really helpful to understanding, you know, what did they set out to do? Did they accomplish it in their own, by their own lights? So yes, that's self-reported data, but I think the geographic data in particular um, looking again at the footprint of these grants and awards and the partnerships um, and even doing some measures like per capita or looking at the poverty level or you know, rural status, et cetera, that could be construed as a pretty objective measure of where the project activities were taking place on the ground when we map that data or where these organizations were. And I know you all, Ryan, at NASA, you do a lot of that kind of mapping work too. Um, I will defer to um, Cliff in terms of um, kind of is, if there's an answer to the how how do we know that the project is successful uh, when it comes to you know particularly since you look at the application side of the process, Cliff. Yeah, I would. I mean, there's there are a lot of different ways of of defining success. I think that um, for a report like this. Um, one of the measurements of success is um, is grant making, right? Um, now there is there there are a multitude of of measurements for for what constitutes success. Um, thinking from a purely grant making perspective and looking at those places that um, those places and those organizations that have de developed. Um, uh, a strong track record of um, successfully um, applying for uh, community-based grants. Um, I, I, that is that is an indicator of a kind of success um, institutionally and organizationally. Um, I, one of the things that's alluded to in the in the recommendations is uh, the need for uh, really some analytical approaches to um, to our other frameworks for for defining success, right? Um, that if cultural sustainability is um, is a high priority um, both for the field and the communities that we're engaging with, how do we measure that? Um, how do we measure that? Let's say through apprenticeship grants. How do we measure that through project grants? If one of the goals of of uh, many folk and traditional arts projects is uh, increasing awareness um, in community of the of the value of cultural expression of, of a variety of kinds of cultural expression how do we begin to measure that um, I think that this is a field that um, is a little bit different from uh, from other disciplines in that there are there's not a, a, a large universe of uh, service organizations that is doing this kind of analysis of folk and traditional arts work and uh, and I think one of the things that we're trying to do is to indicate that we see a real need for that because these are the kinds of things that when um, when people who are in positions to um, to provide resources for something like folk and traditional arts when they say well why does it matter what is it doing how do you measure that we need answers for those things. Um, and so we are beginning to roll out, um, not just through um, through this report, but uh, through a variety of convenings in the field. Um, uh, in a sense, uh, a, a list of those areas that we need to uh, take a deeper look at, in order to be able to talk in a in a deeper and more sophisticated way. Uh, to people who aren't already converted to the to the value and importance of this work. Yeah, and th and this is Sunil again. I I didn't want to play this card because I I feel you all here. Everybody hears it whenever there's a research report. But uh, I will say, uh, in some cases, more research is needed. And uh, I, I will I will add that in this case, um, you know, we we really need you know some of the recommendations that you see on page three, like for you know a longitudinal look at this would really help us a great deal. I think also for a more comprehensive understanding of impact and outcomes, 
uh, we clearly ha have to go beyond self-reported data. So it would require kind of, you know, kind of going to back to site visit, case study approaches, getting some baseline data and following up. So that wasn't what this report attempted to do, but that's a long answer to the simple question. But, um, you know, we do feel that, that there are some measurable ways of, of, uh, of, uh, of knowing whether these projects have hit the mark. Great. Yeah, that, uh, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and it, it sort of goes to this next question. Um, in that, uh, you know, in putting together this report and doing the work, um, were there any data that were not available that you wish you had? So, um, you know, uh, the recommendations speak to um, the need to do more longitudinal analysis in the future. Um, Cliff, you mentioned that there are some places where we wish we had more data um, from, uh, from partners or more complete data from partners. Um, but, um, but in, in doing the work, was there anything about the uh, folk arts portfolio that you'd really like to know, but you felt limited by the available data? Yeah, just really quickly, I would, you know, as a, as a former um, uh, state folklorist at the Maryland State Arts Council, I know that um, our apprenticeship program, when we, when we mapped that out, when we put all of these dots on a map that showed um, where apprenticeship grants were going statewide over uh, the history of the program, the, the geographic reach of that program was extraordinary. However, looking at that from a federal level, looking at that as, as you know, the outcome of a grant to the Maryland State Arts Council, um, that grant looks like one dot on a map in the state of Maryland, right? And so how can we, if I, one thing I would have loved to have seen is a map that shows where all of the apprenticeship grants that state arts agencies have done um, have gone. And I think that what you'd find, and that's, and that's data that lives at the state level, um, I think what you would find is, is um, reach as a field nationwide that is extraordinary. Um, but we don't we don't have we don't have access to that data, um, and I would I would have uh, well I shouldn't say I'd give my my arm for that, but I would have loved to have that information. Okay. Uh, Sunil, anything to add to that? Uh, yeah, I, I would just say that um, to that point, one of the really exciting possibilities of doing a portfolio analysis, we, which we were not able to avail of, is doing some kind of network analysis to see what, you know, we, we, we did pull out that a lot of really fascinating strategic partnerships have, uh, emerged from these uh, grants. And I'm not only talking about the state arts uh, partner, the state folk arts partnerships, but actual, you know, the partnerships within the partnerships and so forth. And I think we, we could do a good job of diagramming that and showing what connections are made to other pots of funding and other resources within a community. And so the more we understand, getting back to the larger point you made, Ryan, about understanding, for example, the partnership money a little better and where that's going, particularly to map it and to understand the networking that goes on, that would be really helpful, along with more robust qualitative research on the text itself and looking at some of the stuff that was funded, the artifacts, the projects that were actually funded and analyzing that. Well, it looks like we are at four o'clock, so we should wrap things up. Um, we could, of course, talk about this um, um, further, but uh, again, uh, Cliff and Sunil have provided their contact information if anyone would like to ask uh, them another question. Um, and also just wanted to say thanks again to Cliff and Sunil for um, being here with us today and congratulations on this work and uh, sharing it to, uh, to this wide audience. So um, uh, again, you'll see the, our last slide here. Um, thanks to Eric for putting everything together. Um, if you have questions about this session, you can reach him at the email address that you see on your screen here. And uh, just thanks everyone for participating and thanks to Sunil and Cliff and we'll talk to, um, uh, we'll communicate with everyone in the future. Appreciate it. Thanks everybody. Thank